he gives a nation their pride back. Italy celebrates Ferrari. Eleven years after their last triumph, the Scuderia are finally Formula One champions again, and of all places, at the legendary home track Autodromo Nazionale di Monza. His name, Andreas Nicolaus Lauda, known as Nicky, one of the best racers of all time. He grew up in Vienna. The upper-class citizens of the Austrian capital live in the village of Putzleinsdorf, as do Lauda's family, not his world. He dreams of the vast world in a race car. Lauda has to secure a bank as sponsor in order to enter the expensive sea. On the supervisory board of the bank sits his grandfather, and he inhibits the deal. Lauda's dream looks to be crushed. It leads to a dispute. He said, no, that's exactly what I don't want. I don't want that you drive races. You should study and carry out a normal way of life. It was a discussion of principles with him, where you couldn't change his mindset. And with that came then the breach. He knows that with his small March team, he stands little chance against stars like Jackie Ix or Stewart. Nick Heed was a very promising uh, driver. Everybody knew at the time he could be, he had, and could be a potential winner for the championship. He was new, and I always thought that Nicky was a good driver right from the very beginning, but he wasn't doing anything spectacular at the beginning. But obviously, he became a fantastically good racing driver and uh, with a terrific head for the job. Lauda is condemned to success, for it's all at stake. The 23-year-old has to run himself deep into debt. The enormous pressure grows, for he has no chance against the top teams, and he drives in the back. But it gets worse. The Austrian team runs into trouble. March went bust at the end of the year. The whole team was gone, with my money. Then, with great effort, I was able to make the transition over to the BRM on another Formula One team, where I was allowed to drive as third driver. And with the BRM, it was as such that in Monte Carlo, I drove around in third position in front of Jackie Ix. That was the Ferrari driver at the time. That then prompted Enzo Ferrari to talk with me and then to sign me up for the Ferrari team a year later. Ferrari was not successful at all in 73. I know it because I was in the team. We were last all the time and so on. If you compare um, uh, the Formula One today and Ferrari in those days, <laughs> it's not just not the same planet. You know, a Formula One team was maybe eight people in those days, including uh, the truck driver. The traditional brand finds itself in trouble claims and performance from Ferrari differ widely. These are chaotic days in 1973, and the cars are bad. And I can remember when I was allowed to test the Ferrari for the first time in Fiorano. What was this weird thing? This is understeered. This is oversteered. It isn't balanced. It's just slow. The pragmatic Lauda and the proud red from Maranello. The differences between the two couldn't be greater. Niki Lauda has a plan. With his cool style, he wants to prevail against all odds. Niki separated himself rather quickly from the legends and said, I have to take the opportunity from Ferrari and use them to my best advantage. I have to test more than all the others. I have to develop more than all the others. I have to make better use of the larger budget from Ferrari than the others can. And in that way, achieve victories. 
and Nikki was able to do just that. Well, Nikki has always been extremely precise in his desire and the way he wanted things. In Maranello, only one man is in charge, Enzo Ferrari. All decisions must be approved by the founder of the brand. He was unbelievably charismatic, Italian, tough personality, let's say. No one was allowed to mutter a negative word about Ferrari. As a driver, certainly not. And the first impression of this Ferrari, after the first round in Fiorano in late 73, was a catastrophe. Ferrari comes and watches how I drive with the car for the first time. And I get out of the car and say to his son, who translates, this is a catastrophe, there's no balance, this car is shit. This is a shit auto. Lauda demanded changes to make the Ferrari a few tenths of a second faster. He said to me, if you aren't half of a second faster, then we're done. The pressure was there. We were then eight tenths faster. With that, we crossed over the first hurdle. There was acknowledgement from Enzo Ferrari. And from that day, the work collaboration actually went quite well. Coinciding with the start of a great career, his past catches up with him again. Lauda doesn't need a lot of time. He ponders briefly, then makes a decision. He does not forgive his grandfather. He died then suddenly. I didn't go to his funeral as the situation at the time was so tense and negative. If you were to ask me today, it would have been more sensible to, at least before his death, give him my hand and reconcile. But at that time, it wasn't possible. Laura prevails with Ferrari. Finally, he seems to have reached the goal line of fulfilling his greatest dream. He transforms the team, professionalizes all sectors. The groundwork for future success has been laid out. 1975 will be the racer Nicky Lauda's year. Already since the second to last race, no one has been able to catch him. Nicky Lauda in the Ferrari, and with that, all of Italy becomes world champion. He is no longer the awkward newcomer. As a friend, I like Nicky. Uh, but as a driver, he was very good and uh, obviously proved that. So he's one of the top racing drivers in the world, without doubt. He's won also three world championships. And I know, Nick is a good man. In the next season, Lauda is already considered one of the favorites. Team and car are working, but he has new competition from England. The charismatic James Hunt will deliver a duel with Lauda that remains today as one of the most exciting the Formula One has ever seen. A former colleague reminisces. The James, my mother. James was always the big Zampano when it came to women. Hunt, a showman. Already legendary, continuously changing female partners. Outside of the racetrack, the good-looking Brit takes everything life has to offer. The Namsi. He behaved in such a way that you thought, really, James? I often said to him, what are you talking about? At times, it was a bit of a shame because it was simply provocative. If I were invited to the royal house in Windsor and then arrive in a tuxedo top with jeans and tennis shoes with my toes sticking out, the front cut out, that doesn't go over well with the people there. You won't be invited back because they say, what is this? What kind of statement is that? It's a bit of a pity that he had to do that. It's nonsense. One can say free spirit. No, it was provocative, unpleasant. Style was also unpleasant. He's repeatedly involved in accidents. His style is criticized as being way too risky. For his team, McLaren, a costly affair. But one wants to see victories. 
James Hunt, he likes to celebrate. The sunny boy image fits to the marketing strategy. He's idolized, even though he never proved any consistent top qualities as a driver. Lauda and Hunt, two different life paths. Cordial, I wouldn't say, but a mutual respect, absolutely. Because James was the same kind of guy as me. As people, we weren't enemies. The 1970s. The sport of racing is as dangerous as ever. It leaves its mark on Hunt. I don't want to die. And uh, it's, it's a source of, uh, it's a steady source of worry to me. You know, it's, it's the one cloud on the, su the sunny horizon of my life. Laura suppresses such thoughts professionally. It's the races that count, nothing else. And he knows that with this, he places a heavy burden on his wife, Marlene. Marlene didn't know at all the kind of dangers we were putting ourselves in, because they see it all from the outside. There are some lunatics driving race cars, but no one is confronted with the risks. The 1st of August, 1976, Nürburgring, the most dangerous track in the world. On this day, the life of Niki Lauda will change profoundly. Every year we were confronted with one or two deaths. The risk that we had to undertake at that time, you had to think about that beforehand. Do I want to take that risk? Everyone who participated in this extreme sport knew I could die. That was a clear decision that one had to take at the time. Thank God, it's not that way anymore. But the insecurity about slamming into something was so high at the time that you had to take it into account. A short time later, nothing is as it was before. From the force of impact, the car hurdles across the road. It burns. Also involved, Hans Joachim Stuck. Your thoughts, it's like tunnel vision, in which you do what you intuitively think is best, whether it's right or not. In my head, I thought, there are still cars coming, I'll warn them. Lauda is in critical condition. His lungs are severely injured. They wanted to drive with the ambulance from the site of the crash up through the rest of the Nürburgring and then back down to Adenau. And there, where the accident was, just one kilometer before it, was the Breitscheid exit, which puts you in the middle of town. I said to the ambulance driver, look, there are no more cars coming. All the cars are sitting there, radios on high. Drive on the shoulder against the driving direction. And they were there in the hospital ten minutes later. For sure, with all the traffic, I saved him an hour's driving time, and they could start with the aspiration of the lungs earlier. The fight to save Niki Lauda's life begins. Surviving. The first question was, alive or dead? I can remember exactly that I saw myself liberated, flying backwards into a deep hole, and I thought that was it. 
And then I immediately began to think about what the doctor was saying, listened, engaged myself, in order not to let myself fall into this lethargic death. And that was the right decision. And the doctors did everything correctly. The lungs were my main problem. I slowly started to come back and was able to fully recover. But I'll never forget that moment where it was really close to the edge. The race was restarted, customary in these times, and Hunt wins. The treatment, especially the lungs, means agonizing pain for Lauda. He must fight insanely hard. Today all the pains are completely masked out. I know that I once had them, but when you ask me now, it's not a bother anymore. Because the most important thing, with or without pain, was to survive. Monsa, just 42 days after the accident, he's back. Someone like Niki Lauda doesn't give up the fight for the title easily. His return after his accident at the Nürburgring, I think, was the most courageous thing that I've ever seen. Motorsport leaves its mark, physically and psychologically, and every driver handles these near-death experiences differently. I can make the comment that burns are the most terrible wound you can have in an accident. A bone, it's okay, everything is okay, but burning, it's really not pleasant. And I'm sure Nikki told you that. Lauda places fourth in Monza. Hunt falls out. The duel goes on. I was beside him when he took his helmet off at the end of the race and he was just bleeding. There was no skin left, you know, because the vibrations of the, the helmet on the car, you know. Uh, you know, it was a great effort by him to do that. At the foot of the volcano in Fuji, Japan, the last race. On this day, the title will be decided, Lauda or Hunt. The course is flooded. The drivers protest. Then came the unbelievable announcement from the race director. Everything had been stopped, but he said, now we'll start the race. I was the driver's spokesperson at the time and said, why now? He said, it's the first race that will be broadcast worldwide on television, and we have to transmit it. Because it's six, it will be dark, and we can't miss out on this experience, cost what it may. At the end of the second round, Lauda suddenly parks his car. He feels the risks are too great. This rational decision could cost him the title. It was the right decision for this situation. I still stand by it today. If I were to be driving today, I would do the same, because the situation is so perverse that commercial rights decide over a flooded course. Lauda is already on the way to the airport when the rain subsides. Well, bad luck. Now a fifth place finish is sufficient for James Hunt. In the chaos of the race, the Brit loses track of the situation. James Hunt glaubt, er at first, James Hunt thought he hadn't won. He was super mad at his team and grumbled about until I said, you're world champion, you dunce. He said, I'm world champion? That was a very special atmosphere. And afterwards, he went crazy. And then came sake and everything else liquid. Nikki Lauda and James Hunt. They'll never be best friends, but the mutual respect runs deep. Lauda accepts what he cannot change, and now the next world champion title is on his agenda. A great assist is his ability to focus to the bitter end, black or white. His second world champion title with Ferrari 
there's no other goal. Finally, on September 11th, 1977, he accomplishes it in Italy. His opponent, James Hunt, lacks consistency. He looks for fun elsewhere. But then something happens that also Nicky Lauda can't control, and he has to make a difficult decision. Somehow the emotion was gone. That the Ferrari car was better than all the others at that time, that was clear. But somehow all the emotions that I had had over the four years of driving with them they were somehow neutralized, the positive emotion. And the emotion that remained was neutral. And when something went wrong, it was double as bad. It wasn't working anymore, like in a marriage. And therefore, I chose to leave. He switched to the Brabham Racing Team. Team manager is Bernie Ecclestone. But the new beginning and fresh motivation that he had hoped for weren't there. I drove out of the pit had endless discontent. I exhorted myself, drive on, contract is signed, enjoy it. But I couldn't resolve the problem. I was then in the pit, had the pressure and the tires checked so that I could have time to think, and then I drove out again and thought, nix, done, the end. I got out of the car, said thanks, and I retired. James Hunt is never able to return to his previous successes. He then retires from motorsport, the same year as Lauda, two careers that couldn't have been more different. I tried with all my strength to reach my goals in a pragmatic and correct manner. And he achieved the same, with a hundred women along the way. Porsche testing site in Weissach. At the beginning of the 80s, the Stuttgart manufacturer wants Team McLaren to coin a new turbo era in the Formula One. In the search for suitable drivers who can fulfill the high expectations, Team McLaren has struck it big. Niki Lauda can't help himself. There, I had the first test drive with McLaren, and I then decided to come back to the sport. For Team McLaren, Lauda is a godsend. He has the ability to drive fast and to develop the team through his example, and to help his colleagues. Nicky was for sure the, the, the man who gave me something. He brought me a, a lot. With the experience of Nicky, having uh, been world champion already, having a different philosophy, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of sport, I was doing, uh, I was really trained physically very well and Nicky was like this and did not look very fit and, uh, and we had some very difficult races and uh, very often I said, oh, it's warm and uh, he's going to be tired or it's going to be, no, he was always there because uh, at the end it's also in, in the end and I learned a lot about that. Lauda leads the team on the track. He's someone whom you can rely on. At the end of the 1984 season, two years after his returning to the sport, Lauda becomes world champion for a third time. Coming back and winning again the world championship, that was impressive. Alain Prost loses the world championship by half a point. I remember very well the party that we had together after, after the rest. That was really uh, something that I would never for, for, forget in my life. That, that is a, a big proof that uh, we, we had fun and we wanted to, we had a fantastic relation. Nicky Lauda ends his unparalleled career in 1985. He had achieved everything that he had wanted to in racing and now looks after his airline that he established years ago. James Hunt is the tragic hero of this story. He continues on living his excessive life to the edge and beyond. Dass diese Reise von ihm dann leider 
This trip of his then went unfortunately south, because you can't maintain a racer performance when you're so destroyed. He drank too much, and maybe he also took too many drugs. I remember still that he was working for the BBC and was completely bankrupted. I crossed paths with him in London and helped him out and gave him money. And then I held this discussion with him. You're going to pull yourself together now or you'll be dead. And he did just that. That was the great thing, that he completely turned himself around, totally healthy, never drank anything nor did anything else, had actually fully come back to the world, and then, unfortunately, completely unnecessarily succumbed to a heart attack. Today, Niki Lauda works as a co-interviewer during German TV broadcasts and for the Silver Arrow team of Mercedes. He's now in his second marriage, the restless pragmatic has become calmer, and he knows who he has to thank for that, his first wife. Today we have the best relationship, Birgit, my current wife also. That all went incredibly well, only because of her personality. That she understood everything, went through it, respected it, and accepted it. Niki Lauda stayed true to himself. He and his rival, James Hunt, were lead actors in the most dramatic season of Formula One history. Lauda senses that he won't be able to keep up with his title-hungry colleagues in the following season. 1985 is finally the year of Alain Prost. He had that smoothness, he had that deliberation, he knew when to go and when not to go. Alain Prost has matured. He's profited from his good relationship with Lauda. When I was uh, losing a, a race on Sunday, I was really, you know, disappointed. I learned a lot with Nikki that said, OK, come with me. I went in nightclub, have a, a nice drink, and uh, forget it, forget everything. And uh, it's, it, it looks stupid, but at the end, I, I really um, had a sort of a, a different attitude, uh, winning or, or losing. And that, that helped me a lot uh, since uh, uh, 84. And in 85, because of that, I really concentrated my season to be world champion, not trying to win every race, you know at least two or three times. I really thought that it was better to finish fourth <laughs> rather than having a risk and get some points for the, for the championship. And I was at least for, for the first time the champion. Proust, one of the most successful and fastest drivers of the Formula One, began his unparalleled career in small go-karts. But the Frenchman would have become associated with something much different. His era coincides with another driver regarded as the fastest driver of all time. Prost's driving skills often stand in the shadow of Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna was sometimes faster, but he didn't drive like Prost. For me, Alan Prost would be my me being an observer of Formula One from my retirement, looking at it, I would put Prost as the best driver I've seen. Prost and Senna, more than opponents. It was characterized by... At the end, it was characterized by personal hatred. One couldn't personally look each other in the eye. So much had to be done to the other that it was truly the closest enemy that one saw when looking at the other person. The years with Senna. For the media, it means exciting headlines. The Formula One finally had some fire again. Also outside of the racetrack, it polarizes, much to the detriment of Alain Prost. If they were cheering for Ayrton, they would help you. But when I say it is really, it's, it's the right word. So it was really, really difficult in your private life too. It was really difficult. I really suffered a lot about that. Still today, the image of his forever opponent clings to the mind of Prost. 
Their story actually started out rather friendly. At the beginning of his Formula One career, Senna fully concentrates on victories and soon earns respect. He was simply unbelievably talented and knew exactly how it worked. He made his mistakes and learned from them. Iron will and an almost unshakable faith in God. These are his strengths. His driving style, spectacular and ruthless. He becomes polarized. In his hometown, on the other hand, he enjoys the support of the entire population. And also at the racing tracks around the world, it revolves mostly around him. Hardly anyone could resist his personality. He simply had charisma. Ayrton was very much a seat of the pants driver. He, he drove, of course, with his head, but nothing like the same head as a Prost, for example. And he would take risks that another man wouldn't, or he would do things that other drivers wouldn't. Alain Prost experiences the heyday of his career. He is the star. It must be decided who will race with him. In retrospect, Prost doubts his recommendation. He brought an opponent into the team who made things uncomfortable. They wanted to, to take Nelson Piquet in the team. And I said myself, why you want to take Nelson Piquet? It looks like the best is Ayrton Senna. Maybe it was my mistake. And Senna doesn't thank Prost. He has a huge ego and he shows it. When he came into the room, everyone looked. Without him saying a word, there was a completely charismatic, strong personality that could drive cars insanely well. These characteristics also Prost does not dispute. When I was racing against Ayrton, you could not imagine and, and believe how difficult it was for me to, to be in France. The introverted Frenchman has distanced himself from his homeland. He's not regarded as being very patriotic. The French media and the public opinion often side with Senna. Loyalty to the countryman is rare. Alain Prost is not only isolated, he faces frequent opposition. We are a country of 50-50, and you have 50% of the people you love you, and in this case, 50% of the people, they hate you, but they really hate you. In 1989, these two worlds collide. Senna is obsessed with winning at all costs. Team agreements do not fit in with his philosophy of racing. We, had a, we always had, when we were in the first row together, we always had a sort of a, uh, agreement that we would not uh, fight uh, before the first corner. And that happened in Imola. And uh, I, I did a better start. And uh, I looked in the mirror, I said, OK. Was, uh, I took my line, and, and then he overtook me. I did not expect that he would over, uh, overtake me. And three days later, I, w I was really furious. We were in a, in a small truck with Ron Dennis and Joe Ramirez, and we were talking about that. And he said, but it's not me who has uh, overtook Alain. It's Alain who has overtook me. I said, what do you say? You have uh, 700 million people looking on TV. If you want to look at the... And we had to show the video. It was really, it was really an unbelievable uh, situation. And... Uh, that was Ayrton. A journalist publishes the story. Senna calls Prost a traitor. The two no longer speak to one another. At the world champion deciding season finale in Suzuka, they collide with one another. Senna is later disqualified. Prost is world champion. And that is the beginning of a hostility that puts to shame everything else that the Formula One has seen so far. Rivalries, yes 
Fights, yes. But a relentless animosity like that between Senna and Prost had never existed before. 1990, back in Suzuka, Senna becomes world champion because he pushes Prost off the track. To do what he has done in, 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 uh, in Suzuka is really unbelievable because the, the, the philosophy behind is, is really difficult to understand, but also the risk that you also take for yourself is really, is really big. And uh, he did not care about that. You know, it was really, uh, that was my biggest problem. It was uh, at one stage I, I realized, how can I fight uh, with the same arms, uh, guns, you know, the, uh, with a, a guy uh, thinking that he, is, uh, he has God with him. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he always think that he's, uh, he, has, uh, he is right. We could see the telemetry because he was flat nothing move and if you if you are if you are a racing driver and you know what that means you know to stay flat before the first corner just to hurt somebody it's it is something that is uh, is really difficult to to understand sometime later Senna admits that his maneuver in Suzuka was intentional it doesn't hurt his image Senna is untouchable he's simply different After two years with Ferrari, Prost switches to the top team Williams in order to secure his fourth world champion title. Before the season ends, Prost announces his retirement. And then something happens at the last race that Alain Prost did not expect. After I retired and uh, the way Ayrton changed completely in one minute on the podium in Adelaide and slowly we came uh, almost like friends, you know, really, really friends, because uh, I understood. He did not want to be the first, he wanted to beat me, for sure. And uh, when I retired, he was uh, completely, uh, completely different. And that was uh, the, the, the best part of the story, you know. Imola, the third race of the 1994 season. Motorsport will be forever changed during these days. That was one of the worst weekends ever for racing, for me personally as well. On Saturday, the Austrian Roland Ratzenberger has a deadly crash. Before, Rubens Barrichello barely survived a serious accident. The events make Senna reflect. We brought it to his attention after Ratzenberger and Barrichello that he as head driver had to get more involved with issues of safety, to which he said he didn't have any time. I then said, but you have to, because you're the only one who's credible and can do it. And to that he said, I was actually right. On Sunday's race day, Ayrton Senna has a deadly crash in the Tamburello curve. The doctors fight in vain to save the three-time world champion's life. The exact cause of the accident remains unknown. More than a million Brazilians come to the funeral service in Sao Paulo from all over the country. The government announces three days of national mourning. It was a mixture between a state funeral and a sport funeral, and you can see that the whole world had lost an idol. A memorial service becomes a demonstration. A land torn apart, united in their belief in good. They cry because he's dead. They celebrate that he lived. To this day, Senna is more than a legend. Senna is Brazil. The whole country was in mourning because he was the national hero. For somebody to be taken away, for someone to be killed, then it's an even bigger issue. And, uh, you know, it was a, a very difficult and sad day. Brazil is in a deep economic crisis. Senna, as the Brazilians say, gave them their pride back. It's hard to describe. He was a person who was able to bring joy to the people. He was a hero in a land where there were no heroes. He 
sport, a part of the history of Formula One that would maybe never happen again. I was a competitor, I was a teammate, and I, I became a friend. What, what, what best? You know? Nothing. They dominate the Formula One headline since 2014. Nico Rosberg against Lewis Hamilton. It was definitely a great duel, and it will continue to be a great duel. And it's then completely normal that there's also friction. And sometimes it's easier and sometimes harder, especially when it's within the team. That's also a great challenge because when you're fighting against an opponent who's driving for another team, I think that's a little easier or different. But within your own team, that's difficult. Friends have long since become opponents. The road to the title has heavily strained the relationship. We've known each other for a long, long time, but and it's not easy being, uh, being in, in, in a championship battle like we had this year. The things you do together, you do them, but otherwise you go your own way. It's completely normal. It's not just like that between Nico and Lewis, it's like that between everyone who's competing against each other at the highest level. Two drivers, two egoists, one goal, only one can be world champion. These are two different people, both equally strong in the car and simply interesting to observe. Hamilton's father makes his career possible, enduring many hardships. My dad had four jobs at one stage to keep us racing. When I was eight, he bought me a go-kart, a very, very old go-kart. He resprayed it and he rebuilt it to make it look like it was new. We won the first six races we did, and then we just kept going. We kept winning, we kept uh, winning championships. Nico Rosberg's situation was much different. Born in Wiesbaden, the German inherited the sport of racing from the cradle. His father, Keke Rosberg, celebrates his biggest victory in 1982 when he becomes Formula One world champion. Nico and Lewis met one another during their days in go-kart racing. Unfortunately, it's very, very hard to make it into the Formula One, primarily because it's so expensive, and all drivers have to find sponsors or people who will support them. And that's not always easy, it doesn't always happen. But of course, having a big name helps. Nico Rosberg still has a rocky road to the Formula One. He has to work hard for everything, as all racers dream of being one of the greats. I was, of course, lucky because of my father and my name. That helped me a lot, helped immensely. Nonetheless, I as well had to win the various stages, or win as many as possible, in order to then make it into the Formula One. The year 2002 is one of the most important in his young career. His fast driving style makes it clear he doesn't only have the name of his Finnish father, Nico Rosberg also has the talent. He fights for the Formula BMW World Championship, and then victory leaves him hungry for more. That year, I then won the Formula BMW World Championship, and then I had tasted the blood of racing. After his victory, his team has a very special surprise for the 17-year-old. We award you with a test drive in a Formula One BMW Williams car. You're speechless, or? Now you have to get up. Stand up, my friend. The tears aren't sitting there, they're running, ladies and gentlemen. Tears are running over his cheek. Amazing, Nico. Isn't it wonderful? It's amazing, isn't it? You weren't expecting that. That was unbelievable, as a 17-year-old to then go from 140 horsepower to 940. That's what the cars were then, to get in and give full gas. That was here in Barcelona, I can still remember. I came out of the pit lane, pushed the pedal through for the first time, and I thought, this can't be for real. It was unbelievable. It was like a rocket, a rocket that had been lit on fire. And it was a special moment for me. Rosberg signs with Williams. He's finally reached his goal. 
the Formula One, where heroes are born, where athletes become superstars, glamour, fame, and money. It's a whole other world. To be one of only 22 people, this is the attraction. In 2007, Lewis Hamilton joins the exclusive club of Formula One drivers. Unlike Rosberg, he has a winning car at his disposal. With McLaren, he wins the world championship in his second year. The buddies from kart racing still have a good rapport with one another. However, Rosberg cannot keep up with Hamilton's speed. The car doesn't allow it. The German only reaches the podium twice. It was definitely difficult in the beginning because it was a new situation. Up until then, when I brought the performance, I could always win. And now, suddenly in the Formula One, even if I brought a great performance, I had no chance of winning because the car was simply not fast enough. And that took some getting used to. It's not nice, but that's the sport. In tennis, it only matters how your form is on the day. The rackets are more or less the same. In auto racing, it's just a matter of fact that it depends on the car. Therefore, the switch to Mercedes in 2010. The Silver Arrow makes a comeback into the highest class of motorsport. However, Nico Rosberg is not the focus of attention originally. For their comeback, the Stuttgarters brought seven-time world champion Michael Schumacher out of retirement. In the internal team battle, Rosberg often stands in front. In 2013, Rosberg receives not only a new car, but also a new teammate, an old acquaintance. It's quite an exciting day for us, the launch of the new car and to be new teammates with, with Nico. We were just saying how crazy it is because we used to be teammates back in 2000 when we were go karts. The difficulty is then to have this duel within the team against my teammate because first and foremost, I have to think about the team and then the duel with him. It's always a difficult compromise. One's own success always stands above all. Can a team drive out the selfishness of a driver? Absolute sinless. Absolutely pointless. I have to say, this discussion that we always hear in the press comes from the team manager, who always wants to convince the drivers, drive in the interest of the team. But that simply doesn't work, because the drivers in the Formula One are egoists to the highest degree, which is also very clear. They're only the ones who have success survive. And you cannot say, hey, could you let your teammate have the success today? Because that will push the brand. That's rubbish. Internal competition. There's still something playful about it. In 2014, turbo engines returned to the Formula One. The new regulations benefit Mercedes. The Silver Arrows kick off the season incredibly strong. The car, world championship-esque. The drivers first rejoice with one another. But who will take the title? Hamilton and Rosberg pose this question amongst themselves. The competition doesn't have a chance. In Monte Carlo, Rosberg locks his brakes during qualifying. Hamilton cannot complete the round. The pole position goes to the German. Was the braking maneuver truly an oversight? Hamilton publicly expresses his doubts. Hamilton said after the qualifying, Nico and I are not friends. Or which qualifying? Monaco qualifying. That's unsympathetic of him to me, I think. Find ich. That was at a time of the year where it was, again, more intense. I would go up and down all year. Why should Louis sit with Nico on a free day and have a coffee? They have other things to do. They're very respectful around one another, but they don't spend their free time together. Because that would end the fun of it. They want to battle against one another. 
The maximum, the maximum that can be achieved is after the race, you're normal around one another again. That you may be a bit friendly with one another, maybe you go have dinner together, make an appearance somewhere together as a team, but as soon as the race begins, you have to be driving. The ground rule, each before each, goes over your head. Whomever is ahead at the end is the winner. Mercedes doesn't want to give any team order. Both drivers should drive against each other. A decision that leads to Rosberg slashing the tires of Hamilton in Belgium. Neither of the Silver Arrows win the race. It was, of course, a racing accident. Absolutely, no argument. Only when two Mercedes cars are driving so predominantly in the lead, then one of the Mercedes stars has to win. Racing accident is clear. If Rosberg had been driving with Vettel or Hamilton or some other driver, it's a racing accident. But when you provoke a racing accident within your own team, in which neither of you win in the end, then the fun stops. For the team, that was the damage. And that's what he was blamed for. You have to. When you're not fighting against a third, but fighting against each other, you have to watch out more. After being significantly reprimanded by management, both drivers finish out the season without any major incidents. At the showdown in Abu Dhabi, Hamilton wins his second world championship. At the end, conciliatory tones are hit. For Nico, 100% is not an easy experience, but Nico did an incredible job, and coming up afterwards was incredibly professional, so I think it just showed the respect and the long, long friendship we've had for many, many years. So. Now we're buddies again. 